Our culture has left Christianity behind. It seeks to form us in its own image. Just like Daniel and his friends, young followers of Jesus must find a new way to embody their faith, one that's faithful to Jesus' teachings and one that is creatively missional towards culture. This is our calling. This is our battle. This is the Daniel Generation. Hey guys, welcome back to the Daniel Generation. We've got a special episode for you here today. As you guys know by now, the goal of this podcast is to create content that equips young Christians living in modern culture so they can live faithfully to Jesus and be creatively missional towards culture without losing hold of their faith. Today we have a very special guest and a good friend of mine, and actually an old professor of mine uh, named John Frederick, and he's coming to us from Australia where he's teaching now. So John, if you want to tell us a little bit about what you're up to now and uh, how you got there, just introduce yourself. Yeah, well, hey, Drew, it's good to um, be on the podcast with you and just uh, to kind of press into these things uh, about doubt and uncertainty in the faith. Yeah, I um, I was teaching where, where I, for f- folks who are listening, where I met Drew was um, at Grand Canyon University in Phoenix when I was teaching um, theology and worship and New Testament and all sorts of stuff there that was fun. Uh, after my third year that, uh, out there in Phoenix, uh, I got an opportunity to come to Brisbane uh, in Australia, which is in Queensland, which is a beautiful place. Uh, and my family was like, my wife's always been sort of, yeah, let's go. Let's do new adventures. Uh, so we took uh, everything, uh, loaded it onto crates, you know, on a boat, basically. And uh, four months later, it all arrived in Brisbane and we you know, wow. we're out, living out here basically for four months with, with no furniture or anything like that. And it's kind of cool, <laughs> new adventure. And it's been really, really fun. Uh, we're at uh, Trinity College Queensland now, which is where I teach and lecture in New Testament and Greek and uh, theology. And uh, mm-hmm. the, the thing I love about it out here is that it's that the kind of MO of the college is um, honest answers to tough questions. So on the mm-hmm. one hand, it's a place where you – hold to the historic Christian faith, but realize that uh, we're not muzzled by the theological formulations of past generations. We can, we can, you know, continually converse with them to come to a greater knowledge and understanding of the truth. And so that's been the best part about it for me. Gotcha. That's great. Yeah. And um, if you want to talk a little bit just about your past education, I mean, I know sure. you went to seminary, I think it was Gordon Conwell, and then you got your PhD from St. Andrews, right? Yeah, so great time. Uh, I loved, I mean, I studied music in my undergrad, and that was good. Of course, in the United States, we have a corrupt um, loan system and a uh, very <laughs> troublesome uh, real problem, I think, um, with with higher education and people paying off loans yeah. and stuff. So I'm still paying off, and look, I will be for 30, 40 years. Oh, wow. Uh, my undergrad, my graduate degree was, you know, a, a good model that I would recommend is your church pays for some of it. Um, mm-hmm. and I paid the rest and then doctoral work was great in Scotland. Um, I was there at this, I came in at the same year that NT Wright moved in, I actually got to help oh, move him dream. into his house. <laughs> oh, wow. And, uh, he, this was my first week in Scotland. I was sitting there, um, eating, uh, tomato soup and, uh, crackers and cheese with Tom Wright and his wife, <laughs> while well, he told me how Richard Hayes and I play, you know, guitar <laughs> together, and Bob Dylan songs and all this. And I was like, is this, <laughs> is this happening? That's amazing. Yeah. So that was very influential for me. <laughs> My supervisor out there, Grant McCaskill, who's now at Aberdeen as the chair of New mm-hmm. Testament. Oh, wow. This was an amazing experience to work with these people. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, those aren't, those aren't small names either. You know, if you think of N.T. Wright, uh, for not, people who not. don't know, yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> he's a pretty influential scholar, um, at least in New Testament theology right now. Uh, that's just awesome. I remember that was one of the things you kind of introduced me to his work and that was the rabbit trail that just sent me off the deep end. <laughs> I mean, that like <laughs> undid everything I thought I knew about yeah. faith. Um, and, and really actually, it's almost relevant to what we're talking about today. It kind of sent me on a spiral, a good spiral though, right? Where you start to investigate yeah. all these things that you took for granted, you know, all the traditions that were handed to me. Um, mm. So I really, I have you to thank for that in a lot of ways, you know, sending me out into just broader scopes of theology. 
um, which we're kind of going to talk about some of that today. I know that when I asked John to come on the podcast, the uh, the topic he thought would be most relevant is one he's actually been talking about uh, in Australia, and that's doubt, um, and how we can navigate doubt faithfully and avoid some of the pitfalls that we that we come into contact. So, so that's what we'll talk about a little bit. Is you know what is doubt? How does it uh, how does it impact us? And and what are the typical ways that we handle them? And if they're even helpful, um, that you know the way that most traditions interact with them. So, John, if you want to just start off, I mm. guess the question first is. What is doubt for the typical modern Christian, and how do we tend to handle yeah. that? Yeah, so just um, you know, bouncing off something that you said a minute ago in class, which as someone who's who's a professor, right? You, you and I've been through what you've gone through, and what basically all my mm-hmm. students who grapple with these things. I remember one professor in seminary started talking about you know philosophy and foundationalism and epistemology and all stuff. I was like, this is so above me. I've never thought at this level, and it's causing yeah. uh, anxiety, but also excitement. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, and a student raised her hand in class and said, why don't you just teach the Bible? Whatever the Bible <laughs> says, just teach the Bible and stop with all this extra stuff because it's throwing us off. And he yeah. said, um, said, look, you can either, you can do that and bury your head in the sand and be comfortable, or you can actually engage and grow and, and you know, expand uh, where you're at. And so I was like, well, I've got to go that route now. I can't, I can't. Yeah. It. So, yeah. But it was painful and it was, it was meant, I mean, my mind hurt <laughs> after trying to do these things. Um, I think the way I frame it is like this, the way, my, the way that I've been talking about it, at least out here, um, for what it's worth is that I see, um, doubt, not as something that we need to deny. And I see uncertainty on the other hand, not as something that we need to celebrate. And, Gotcha. Instead of denying doubt and, and building up this perfect, impenetrable fortress of faith ideas that we have, or mm-hmm. on, on the other side, just saying, embrace the mystery, man, God is an ocean, we can't know <laughs> anything. That other side of it, where we just kind of leave the faithfulness of God behind, leave the witness of Christianity behind and go into this ethereal realm of, you know, the black hole of uncelebrate, you know, of uh, yeah. uncertainty celebration. Um we, we really have to uh, kind of seek, I think most of us want to seek a middle way, a, uh, a way between those excesses of denial and celebration. And I think of that way as confronting doubt, so not denying it, confronting it, and then finding a healthy way to integrate it. But really, I think the root of doubt is in a faulty view of faith that we have as Christians. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's where I think the, the root of unhealthy doubt is. Uh, and unhealthy doubt either causes us to try to explain everything away, which we sort of in- intuitively know is not possible. Mm-hmm. Or on, and, and we, we kind of go, oh, I, I, I almost feel like this isn't convincing, but I have to have a way to explain everything or else my faith falls apart. Yeah. Um, so unhealthy doubt causes us to deny the doubt or to really just float away and, and lose our faith. And I've seen both. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I mean, that is, that is pretty much the lay of the land, you know? I mean, on one hand, I just remember even like the first couple of years of my university experience, a lot of people came from that tradition where, where doubt's almost like this boogeyman that's kind of hiding underneath the bed, right? And <laughs> he starts to creep up and you're like, oh no, I'm doubting, which means that I'm going to lose my faith and then I might not be a Christian. Right. And there's almost like this, there's this like really big fear about that, which almost, I think, drives people to the other extreme you're talking about, right? Where doubt becomes like this divinized virtue, almost like, oh, if you're not doubting, then you're not actually, you're not actually a Christian either, you know? Um, No, I I totally agree. And I think Peter Rollins, and this isn't to, I like some of the stuff Peter Rollins says. Yeah. But, um, and so like when I criticize, I'm not the kind of person that's like, don't read Brian McLaren, don't read Rob Bell. (laughs) I'm like, no, read, read them, but don't, you know, don't just say, this is so good. I'm just going to totally throw myself into that. Because then you're no yeah. better than the person who only worships John Piper or John MacArthur, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, literally, if you de- deviate from MacArthur, you're a heretic. I, yeah, I, he's I heard, the, uh... yeah, he's, you know, he's the, the pope of kind of <laughs> that. Fo- yeah, yeah, yeah heard, he's the Protestant uh, you know, pope, yeah. Yeah, uh, Wretched Radio recently was doing, um, and sometimes I, I, I have this kind of unhealthy lunchtime obsession where I go on and listen to fundamentals complain on YouTube. <laughs> Um, I don't know why. It's just fun for me to do that. But they yeah. were complaining, Francis Chan, 
Francis Chan has fallen off the deep end. He's hanging out with oh, charismatics. Gosh. We saw him with Bethel, and mm-hmm. they think like Bethel is is like satanic or something. Yeah, if there's um, something you should avoid being, it's Bethel in, the, in their view. Right. In their view, because <laughs> like it's the charismatic, and and, and, yeah. and so they're they're you know heresy hunting all the time. But the uh-huh. people who gravitate towards like Peter Rollins because I don't know he has a cool Irish accent or something, um, mm-hmm. and sounds profound. I notice sometimes they just give themselves over to that, and it's too simple. It's too simple of a solution yeah. to go. Let me just fall again to the left or the right, rather than to grapple with the reality. But Peter Rollins talks about like doubt is divine, and uh, truly knowing God is realizing that He's nothing, and all this, and and you know we, we yeah. have to have pyro theology to burn all the. Yeah theology down now I, I agree we should have pyro theology to burn toxic concepts within theology down uh, concepts yeah. that uh they're unhealthy but he wants to burn it all down and yeah and what he I'm wants to make is, something yeah, completely different that's right yeah and people people then you know and that's fine if you're in a religious studies department and you want to just explore that's one thing but if you're like a church pastor and you're just leading people into the pit of nothingness and saying embrace this yeah. It gives them nothing to hang on to in the midst of a life that is full of despair and tragedy and and, and anxiety. And uh, I want to say that there's, there's a lot more. And you mentioned this thing about losing your faith, right? And that's the thing. When, you know, there's a, rightly so, I think, there's an emphasis in Christianity on faith in relation to salvation. Mm-hmm. You know, think of like Ephesians 2 verses uh, 8 through 10. Uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, mm-hmm. not by works, so that no one may boast. And you go, good, so I have faith. I give that faith to God, and he gives me the salvation, the sort of transactional model, if you will. Yeah. But the problem with that, right, is that, like you mentioned, Drew, uh, as, soon as, you, as soon as you say, what if my faith isn't strong enough? You know, what, if my, um, what if my faith isn't correct enough? Mm-hmm. What if my faith isn't able to persevere and then I doubt and I die doubting? Uh, yeah. Am I then lost forever? And I, the way that I, I have been putting it out here and in some of the stuff I've been writing is that faith that operates like that is op- actually faith in our own intellect, faith in our own yeah. certainty, oh, faith in ourselves. Instead mm-hmm. of faith in the demonstrable faithfulness of God as we see it from Genesis to Revelation, his faithfulness is the foundation for our faith. What we grab onto hmm. and trust is his faithfulness. Uh, and yeah. so faith isn't isn't so much a currency that we give to God or a box that we tick to get salvation. It's kind of a badge that we wear in a realization that we're holding on tightly and clinging to his faithfulness. That's, yeah, that's huge. I remember the first time that you explained that concept in class and, and it kind of clicked because the first time, you know, you have all these working definitions in your mind of like what faith is and you have your little model that you've built. And when you say something like that, the first time I heard it, it kind of like didn't register. But then mm. I remember when it clicked, it was, it was so eye opening because yeah, for so long, just like you explained, there's this model where faith is kind of, you know, how you always put it like this, like faith is like this stuff that you kind of have or you generate somehow. And then you give God your faith stuff and he gives you his righteousness stuff. But that's still totally transactional, which if we respect reformational theology or even patristic theology of of salvation, then it's not about anything we do, right? It's completely grace. Right. So then faith can't be like a stuff or like, you know, any sort of substance. It has to be just what you said. It's, it's, it's rooted in, in who God is and his faithfulness towards us. And that's, that's almost foundationally shifting from what, at least I think a lot of people's working concept is. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, you, you have these people who, um, you, pe- pe- for instance, here's an example, right? And we've probably mm-hmm. talked about this, you and I, uh, either in class or just anecdotally, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> faith, you know, it's a desert island Christian sort of thing. Or, or say yeah. you have a Muslim child who is not, has not been exposed really to like a robust evangelization. And everybody's worried, can that child be saved? Well, they haven't had faith. Yeah. See, to me, that, that, that framing of the argument just says, still, it's salvation by works, by the work of faith yeah. that they do. And you're saying God, uh, actually, God God wants to save them, but you know, they didn't get the message in time or those sort of things. So I'm not saying we embrace universalism. I'm not mm-hmm. saying any of those, those things. But I'm saying, uh, even for the Christian, basing our faith on God's faithfulness uh, 
really frees us from saying, "Oh, I've ha- I, my faith has to have the the correct, the correctness, the quantity, the uh, quality of a certain degree, mm-hmm. so that it works in this transactional way." But I mean, like we sing it, we sing this sort of stuff all the time. Like, yes, and amen, yeah. the, the worship song. Um, you know, it says in the, the bridge, house fire song, yeah. Yeah, the house fire song. Yeah, great song. Y- y- Yoda's favorite worship song. Um, Faithful <laughs> you are, faithful forever you will be. Um, so, <laughs> so the next great. time you sing that, like you know, in Star Wars, when, when y- Yoda's passed on and, and now he's part of the Force or whatever, and he just pops yeah. up and he goes, mm. "Just be thinking of him when you sing that song." And mm, faithful you are. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I've never thought about. I'm never going to be able to sing that song again without hearing Yoda now. <laughs> yeah, this is what happens with me. But I love that song because the bridge says, um, I-, "I will rest in your promises." Yes, yeah. My confidence is in your faithfulness, and I'm like, that's exactly right. That's that's. I mean, because then you're looking at scripture, and a child could understand this. You could say, just mm-hmm. as. Um, you know, I was explaining it last night as when, when I taught my son, um, for example, to ride his bike a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. took the training wheels off and, you know, holding the bike with him and he's, you know, trusting me. And, and finally, after 20, 30 minutes, he's going little bits on his own. And then after an hour, I'm like, wow, he's riding his bike all on his own. And it's this big moment in the life of a father and a son. Beautiful thing. Um, but, you know, I didn't make him take a physics class in the physics of cycling and how scientifically that works so that he can believe yeah. that, the site, <laughs> that this is uh, a worthwhile endeavor, you know? Or I didn't say to him, let me take the whole bike apart, show you all the different pieces, put it back together, and then you can ride. So he didn't trust me on the basis of qualifications or explanations or expertise. He trusted yeah. me on the basis of the character that he knows me to be, that is dependable, reliable, gotcha. faithful. And so when we think of that relationship between father and son, so it is for us between us as fathers and uh, sons you know, and daughters to God. And so I think that yeah. that's a good example of where instead of the uh, faith of the professor of certainty or the scientist who has abstract uh-huh. ideas and theories, we need to have what Jesus said, the faith of a child or else we won't inherit the kingdom of God. And that's a beautiful oh, thing yeah. because it's not uh, monopolized by the academic elite or the PhDs or the clergy it's it's completely mm-hmm. egalitarian in the sense that it can go to the smallest child. They understand yeah. what faithfulness and trust is. It's us who did it wrong. Gotcha. Well, and then that almost creates a, you know, I, which I guess is the goal of this whole conversation, that almost it seems to create a healthier space for doubt because then you're not you're not at risk of, you know, eternal damnation because one day you doubt that exactly. maybe the, the virgin birth was a thing, you know, just because you're right. struggling intellectually with the concept, you can still be, you know, fully involved in church life and following Jesus to the fullest and have questions, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think that kind of gives more, more room for that because then there's not as much on the line, so to say, you know, you're not worried that, Oh, if I die in this current, you know, emotional state of doubt, then, <laughs> then all is lost. And uh, why did I even, you know, why did I even try to do this from the, from the first place? Um, yeah. And it kind of reminds me too, it's that verse, I think it's in uh first or no second Timothy where it's, you know, when, when we are faithless, he is faithful. Mm. Yeah. It's a so, great I mean, verse. That yep. same, same thing you're saying. It's like, if it's based on our continual intellectual agreement, I mean, that's almost a covert form of Gnosticism, is it not? That yeah. our ability to grasp some sort of truth is what gives us some sort of key to heaven, as opposed to God's own character being being what we're rooted in and our identity is rooted in. Amen. And I think, dude, it's weird to think, I mean, when you think about it, like, yeah, that's how I thought before. And so I would fiercely protect the fortress of my faith that mm-hmm. I built up. Um, and so you can't take any bricks out of that building. You can't take any cards out of that house of cards. Yeah. Because, you know, if you do, the whole thing falls apart. And and so you're Mm -hmm. just constantly protecting the fortress. Doubt can come, you know, and approach the gate, but it's never allowed to breach the gate, uh, in any, Mm -hmm. any, any real way. You know, I think like you mentioned that second Timothy verse, other verses that often because of translations from the Greek into the, the English, we, I think read in that old paradigm of my faith saves me because I had faith, et cetera. Yeah. Um, if we reread verses like Romans 3.22, mm-hmm. 
it doesn't actually speak first and foremost about our faith in God. It does include that. So that is important. I'm not saying that's not important. Uh, mm -hmm. It's vital and crucial and, and good. But it's just saying that the basis, the foundation is actually God's faithfulness. I mean, Romans 3.22 says, you know, um, that God's righteousness, which really means his faithfulness to the covenant that he made with Abraham and all the way back in Genesis, that through mm -hmm. this people, he would save and bless all the families of the earth, which he's now done through Jesus. He's been faithful to that. It says God's righteousness has come about through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ is literally what it says hmm. in Greek. Pistisiesu Christu in Greek. And there's de scholars debate that, but it says God's righteousness through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who trust in him, for all who believe. And yeah. so that, that prior, prioritizing of God's faithfulness as the basis and foundation of salvation, as, as um, the ultimate uh, and, and basic way that we're saved. And then, you know, look at Galatians 2.20. Um, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And, of course, yeah. you could also translate that faith in, but um, the, most translations take faith in Jesus Christ, which, again, prioritizes yeah. our faith. But I think the, the priority has to be on God's faithfulness. And what our faith is is just grabbing hold of that. So some days we're mm -hmm. crawling towards, we're clawing, trying to hang on. Yeah. And that's still valid faith. And actually, it's part of what makes our faith stronger in the long run. Because mm -hmm. we're, we're holding on even though we don't understand. Our faith is seeking understanding. It doesn't require understanding as a prerequisite before we have faith or to continue having faith. Yeah. When I like... I like to, oh, there's a book, which of course, you know, now that we're recording is going to escape me, but there's almost there's this idea going around that, you know, truly faith. I mean, the word pisteo, and you can vouch for this more than I could, means trust and allegiance more than it does intellectual assent, right? That would be gnosis. Mm. And mm. so I remember when you shared that, when you showed me Romans 3.22, which that was for me, that was like one of those bricks that you removed because that was the model I was working off of at the time was oh, I have sure. all these bricks and I build them up correctly and the fortress stands. When you showed me that that's translated the way it most often is, and then you made a case for the other translation, you know, that it's through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That was, that was so profound because, I mean, first off, the most common translation, you know, it's redundant. It says, I have it pulled up here. It says the righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. That's mm -hmm. like through faith, through faith, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but if you translate it the other way, it's it's through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to all who believe. So like, you, like you've been saying, it's we're rooted in this because he is faithful to us, which is so much more secure than, you know, than our wavering yeah. interactions with, with intellect and uh, with, you know. And it's, I think it's emotional. I think as, as studied as we can be, at least for me, the days I doubt, the days that I have, you know, qualms and I'm like, I don't know, man, maybe it's not true at all. Those days are typically mm -hmm. an emotional reaction to something that's going on. You know, like sometimes it can be that I just didn't sleep well. And then other times it can be that there's this big struggle in my life and I'm not necessarily seeing how God is working it out yet, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, that's, and that's, yeah. that's true. I mean, and, and you know, there's a number of ways that this plays out. So, I mean, I think when we have that, that idea of faith as a uh, impenetrable fortress of ideas that are perfect or something um, that, I, that I have, mm -hmm. first of all, it's preposterous, right? Because we as finite creatures cannot mine the depths of the infinite God. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't even, through our own language, we can barely approximate things about him. We can say things about mm -hmm. him, but, but I mean, God, God didn't create the earth speaking English, you know, um, uh, mm -hmm. so, I mean, our English words are, are, are signs and symbols that point to realities, but mm -hmm. we don't have direct access to, you know, God's mind or something. Um, but yeah. things like, you know, the, the ability to embrace mystery, for example, or uh -huh. in the midst of tragedy to accommodate, uh, and not lose our faith to accommodate, uh, tragedy and mystery. I, I remember I was listening to, I mean, I really like some of the stuff on the liturgist podcast. I just like their authenticity and their willingness mm -hmm. to ask questions. But I sometimes, I guess I'm unsatisfied with where they land because where they yeah. land is sort of this broad sort of, I, I resonate with them. Like I could sit down and have a beer with them or just, 
I would be good uh-huh. friends with them if, if I were in their kind of community. Uh, and I yeah. wouldn't be like, you're not a Christian and you're a bad person or anything. So I'm not <laughs> judging them. But they have this, you know, they have this story about how they went to Germany and they saw the Holocaust sites and they basically became atheists for a time. And then now uh-huh. they're reconstructing their faith. But they say things like God's an ocean today. I, this is what he means to me and all this stuff. And you go, man, I, when six million Jews are exterminated by, you know, um, the Nazis, uh, one third of the population of Jews alive at that time in the world, that should make you stop and say, how is a good God able to be held in tension with this? Right. Yeah. So I, I commend them for doing that and for not denying and say, ah, easy explanation, easy explanation. Let me protect yeah. my fortress. Yeah. But but when they move their way of thinking, they when there's things that they can't explain. They, mm-hmm. they, they, they just cannot explain when they move themselves out of the framework and trust in God's faithfulness. And they say, I'm going to question even that I'm going to lay that aside because mm-hmm. it can't be true. Cause I can't figure it out. I think one, they're putting their own intellect above God's, you know, immensely, infinitely yeah. more wise and good intellect. So what I would prefer is to integrate and confront doubt Rather than to deny it or to just celebrate, ah, oh, we don't know. It's hmm. an ocean. It's a mystery. And so, I think what I would say to people in those sort of situations is, yeah, it's good to confront it. It's healthy to confront it. Yeah. But in those situations, you know, like trust in the things that you can know about God, mm-hmm. rather than the, rather than to um, demand answers to the things that honestly are probably beyond our ability to even know in any case yeah. whatsoever. So His goodness. His faithfulness, his trustworthiness, his loving kindness, mm-hmm. the fact that he came into the world to, to take on sin and to exhaust its power and to defeat death. Um, hmm. You know, um, I mean, sometimes even those things come into question. We can talk about that in a minute. But but just those big issues of life, like in New Zealand, we've had this um, shooting and it was an Australian citizen who went over there. And, yeah, it was terrible. And we've had this in the States and it's just how can God allow this? And there's just so many things like this that happen. And it's sometimes people think it's a cop out, but I say, you know, I don't have an answer to that because I'm not God. Yeah. Um, nevertheless, because of the in- internal testimony of the spirit that I've experienced the richness and goodness of God, his mercy mm-hmm. and loving kindness, his literal presence. Uh, and because of what I see as witnessed in scripture as revelation, I trust in his faithfulness, not in my intellect. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then I try to explain great. it. I work it out after I want to try and find – I want to go beyond that. Mm-hmm. But at the base level when I'm just hanging on, it's the demonstration of God as a good father who has stayed true to his word that mm-hmm. he is not going to let his good creation go down you know, uh, without salvation and redemption. Yeah. I No, I really like that, especially what you said about confronting it You know, because I think at some point – and you mentioned this earlier a little bit, at some point, if we're just doubt deniers, then we're kind of being dishonest to our own emotional grids, you know? I mean, at some point to say that, you know, oh, you know, this was all part of God's plan when something like the tragedy that just occurred in New Zealand occurs, that's, that's kind of, I mean, it's not kind of insensitive. It's almost blatantly insensitive. Right. And it's it's just so trite. Yeah. Yeah. It's destructive too. And I, I know a lot of people, probably people who start off bouncing to the other end of, you know, worshiping uncertainty, they probably start off trying to just avoid looking like a jerk by being that way. And then now you have nothing to hold on to at all. Um, yeah. And that's made, it. That's it, you Drew. Uh, you, you're totally right. And I think that's why I, I at, the, at one time, like I resonate with the impulse of the people who they don't just want a little truism. God will work all mm-hmm. things for good according to those who are called according to his purposes. And you go, oh, thanks. That really helps me deal with yeah. the greatest tragedies of the world. <laughs> that, like that heals and, my emotional wounds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's just to, it's it's healthier, I think, to to actually go to the mystery route. But mm-hmm. instead of letting yourself get sucked into this black hole of uncertainty, where there's nothing, mm-hmm. which to some people is freeing for a time, but you have nothing to hang on to. Mm-hmm. I guess it's agnosticism is better than outright atheism. Yeah. But um, I just think that when we say, you know what, I'm going to let that sit within the framework of God's faithfulness. Mm-hmm. I'm going to prioritize that rather than my own understanding. I think yeah. that's more humble than and and and, uh, and more healthy 
than simply just saying, I'm going to let it all go. Uh, yeah. Because because you have something to hang on to. That it's not just wishful thinking. It's on the basis of who God's revealed himself. But what happens, right, when when even those core things come into um, yeah. come into doubt? I think that's another thing altogether. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I wonder, you know, if we might talk about that a little bit, because sometimes it's like, well, okay, yeah. I don't, I changed my mind on baptism. It's like big deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's not like a, that's not necessarily a faith destroying thing. You can still hold yeah. tightly to at least a creedal faith. Yeah. Like some people, like they go from, Oh, I was Presbyterian and now I'm Anglican. And I'm like, okay, yeah. you've made the right choice. Okay. But, yeah, clearly. Um, <laughs> By the way, everyone listening to this podcast, make that choice. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's so like those sort of things are like shifting. Like, yeah, you can, you know, it's not going to kill you in, in terms of life of faith. Uh, even things like you go from you're really jazzed about the rapture to you go, oh, I have a totally different view of the end. None of these things yeah. are going to, unless you, your view of faith is so that it's got to be King James only, that it's got to be this. You're yep. just defending all the time, and you just those people are not happy. I I love when those people try and convert me. Um, I pretend <laughs> I'm an atheist and uh-huh. let them tell me about the gospel, and then I try to convince them of infant baptism from First Peter. Oh, that's uh, so amazing! <laughs> it's a bit yeah, and that happened to me. Next in Arizona, time, can we actually. record one of those conversations? Just turn the mic on, and <laughs> we'll put that on for everybody. Yeah, That'd it was great, hilarious. man. When they came to my door in Phoenix, I said uh, they they were from um, I think his name's Stephen Anderson. He's out there, and he's uh-huh. one of these. Um, these guys just just kind of one of those YouTube sort of uh, cantankerous oh, yeah. curmudgeons. I think I know who you're talking about. I've um, seen that guy, yeah. And his his guys came to my door, and they were these young dudes, and they were like, hey, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm like, tell me about that. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I told them, I said, so you think like every, there's literal, like whatever scripture says, it's literal every time. You just take what it means. It literally means it's clear. And they were like, yes. Uh-huh. And I was like, let's turn to First Peter chapter 3. Oh, no. <laughs> Baptism now saves you. And that's what uh, it says exactly, yeah. And I was like, "So, guys, I think, I think, uh, I think we need to do some some thinking here." And they were like, oh, <laughs> no, "No, that's just that's metaphorical." Uh, and the, and oh, they, so now it's metaphorical, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was like it's like boom, the end yeah. of the cr- and and so I feel in some ways feel bad, but it's like you're freeing people. But sometimes the, when that can, is not freeing is if you're a pastor and you're like everything you always do is wrong. And yep. that's where some of the emergent, like I, I resonate with the emergent guys, uh-huh. like McLaren and all those guys. Yeah, and McLaren I came out of the, the ch- emerging church movement, which was some of it was conservative, some of it was progressive, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, Shane Claiborne and all these things. Um, mm-hmm. But um, some of them just are like big, big hint, big, big announcement. Everything's wrong. And then their, yeah. their solution is is like basically a recapitulation of mainline liberal Christianity Mm-hmm. It's dying everywhere because people are like, we don't like, you know, uh, this sort of, like, how is that different than the Democratic Party's platform? You know what I mean? Whether you're a Republican or Democrat doesn't matter, but yeah, it, it's essentially like a Christianity costume, but underneath it, it's like liberal democratic values, like be nice to each yep. other, equity, fairness. It's like, well, what human being thinks murder is good? <laughs> yeah, like, that's not on the table of questions normally. <laughs> yeah, you you go like yeah, like every like decent human being, whether they're a Satanist or an atheist or a Christian, is going to go like pretty much murder is bad. You do unto mm-hmm. others all the good things. But if that's all Christianity is, then don't give your money or your life to the church. It's got to be Absolutely. the feet of death through the faithfulness and victory of God and Jesus Christ, or else you know just like you know go like uh, I don't know like buy some Reiki crystals or something. Yeah. Yeah, at that point, what's the difference? It's just almost a shell for, you know, kind of modernist values that that really, I mean, I think philosophically, it's there's not there's nothing to stand on there anyways, then the whole system starts to fall apart. So when you do the same thing to Christianity, the same yeah. thing kind of happens. There's a guy, it's I, boring. Yeah. There's a guy out there actually in Australia um, named Mark Sayers. I don't know if you've heard of him at all. But he has a book about this called The Disappearing Church that I read, which I think is is spot on. And his basic thesis is that, you know, like at least in, in missionary context, typically what we've done, if we go to what he would call a first culture, which is a culture that's never experienced the gospel, typically the best practice is to contextualize the gospel to their culture, right? 
and then you redeem it. And that's been the practice, right? And that's yeah. to avoid making them all European whitewashed, you know, like the colonialist <laughs> problem. That's so right. let's that's contextualize great. it, right? Well, then the problem he would say in his book with, with you know, like the modern evangelical uh, kind of seeker movements and, and uh, emergent movements is that they take that same idea and they're trying to apply it to what he would call a third culture, which is, you know, like modern Western culture. And his basic idea is that our current culture is built off of deconstructing the Christian culture it came from. So when mm. you try to contextualize the gospel to something built off of, you know, taking it apart, you actually lose the gospel instead of regaining the culture. Oh, that's um, great. And I think that's kind of what you see with the emergent movement, right? Is let's be hip and, and cool and relevant. And, you know, even with some of the seeker movements that came before it, let's look more like a rock concert and, um, and, yeah. and look cool to culture and then, but the means kind of becomes the message when you start to do those things and focus on those things in a yeah. culture that's moved on from the meat of the values they're holding, you know, you start to actually lose that meat yourself. Yeah, that's um, good, man. That's, that's rich. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, that's a profound, um, profound way to think about it. And I think it's, <laughs> it's telling too, that when people stepped back, cause the emerging conversation is kind of now sputtered and it's, mm-hmm. there's different conversations happening. And if mm. some listening may not even know what that was, it was in the 2000s yeah. when, you know, postmodernity was just being realized that we're in a post-Christian culture and that, uh, et cetera, et cetera, like we need to rethink church. Most of the people that were talking about this were like, we need to get away from this white European thing. Well, look at most of the people in the emerging movement. They're white North Americans. <laughs> so ironic. Yeah. They weren't, and they were, <laughs> they were trying to export that. And the people in the uh-huh. global South where Christianity is exploding, it's just massive. We're saying like mm-hmm. we don't want this Western, you know, kind of <laughs> uh, like they're like they're planting churches in North America because they're like forget that. Ridiculous. Yeah, well, that's the whole ACNA. Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. I think the other thing to think about though, as we kind of start drawing towards the end is uh, of our conversation is, you know, it it, it is. Uh, I do as a Christian, I, I want to acknowledge that um, there are some core key things that constitute you know, the historic Christian faith, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, fine, if we wanted to have a religious studies department and look at it as a philosophy or as a historical movement, we don't have to, like, we we can talk about it as a phenomenon or whatever, like we would anything else, like Aristotle Uh or Plato, Jesus and the teachings and all that. But as Christians and people who are pastors, there does become the problem when we start to say, well, you know, what about the virgin birth and what about the resurrection and those sort of questions? We know mm-hmm. they're central to the faith, but they're not like baptism and they're not like one's theology of the Lord's Supper. They're the mm-hmm. central thing. So if those go, unlike the other things, it is like, you know, the faith unwinds and then what do we really yeah. have? And we're rethinking Christianity in its entirety. And what I think speaks well to me in, in those times is that um, when we struggle with the resurrection, say, right, uh-huh. um, we we often struggle with it because we try to use reason to explain it. Huh? Yeah. Um, but uh, we're talking about using reason to explain something which is literally unreasonable, which <laughs> defies yep. reason. You know, so yeah. like we're like, it doesn't make sense. It's like, yeah, that's the point. Um, hmm. There's nothing like it. It's not like here's how mathematics works. Here's how physics works. Here's how resurrection works. Yeah. Point A gets you to... <laughs> Man, it's like Kierkegaard talked about. You you get to a point at the edge of the precipice and there there's a leap of faith. Now, for Christians, the leap of faith isn't mm-hmm. just a blind leap. It's based on kind of the trampoline of God's faithfulness that yeah. precedes that leap and empowers and grace gives us the ability to take that. So it's not a blind leap. But um, we we can't use human reason to get to God because God is... There's an infinite qualitative distinction between yeah. God and every other thing we know. And so we can't say, just just like I do history, that's how I do God. Because with the New Testament, we've got the most reliable manuscripts in the history of antiquity. Uh-huh. But it tells us the most unbelievable story. You know, you have yeah, the so kind true. of, you have the, the illogical nature of the incarnation. You have the ridiculousness of the resurrection. Mm-hmm. You know, you have the inconceivable nature of the Immaculate Conception. Um these things cannot be gotten at through reason. Mm-hmm. We, we have to, um, we, I think when we struggle with that, we have to say, uh, trust in God's faithfulness gives us the power to persevere 
uh, hmm. when we can't explain by reason that which is beyond reason itself. And so grasping on oh, the God by brilliant. faith is, 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 you know, for me, uh, yeah, I can ask questions about that, but I don't have to call into question the whole Christian faith because I can't explain the resurrection. You mm -hmm. won't be able to explain it today, tomorrow, maybe ever, because it defies human reason and operates yeah. according to the infinite wisdom of God, not to the finite rationality of human beings. Well, and I think that's, I think that's actually where the hope of faith even comes from, right? I mean, I, I'm trying to remember who it was, but you know, there's philosophers that talk about if you can explain exactly who God is, then you're not talking about God, you know, kind of like that's Anselm, right. like he's the idea, right. the greatest thing that you can conceive and he'd be beyond that even. If yeah. I could explain mathematically how a miracle works, it's not a miracle anymore, right? At some point, right. if it's all if it's all natural phenomena, not that God can't use natural phenomena and does probably more often, but if yeah. it's all yeah. just that, then what is God even to us but some right. other conceivable being, you know? And yeah. then at that point, like you said, you're talking about doctrines. Like if you start to try and wrap God in this completely understandable box, then how would he even have power over death? So I think, yeah. you know, and that's something like early on in my faith, at least apologetics were kind of useful in, yeah. in that I was like, okay, there's at least some sort of rational way to hold to this. And I think you made a good point. It's usually the best way to, to come to a rational conclusion of faith is through studying like the textual criticism of how many documents we have that go back. And then, you know, even like apostolic witness, you know, we have right. writings from the people who talk to the apostles that very early on, like, you know, I'm thinking of first Clement very early on attest to the resurrection and attest to the central core tenets of faith. So just by word of mouth, we know that they at least believe those things as early on as the apostles, but making the leap to saying this dude was dead. And then he just got up three days later. You can't explain that through science. Uh, it's supernatural. You know? And we hate that because yeah. we want to <laughs> commodify today, yeah. and contain God. Yep. We want him to be contained and to be uh, tamed in some mm -hmm. way, to be to be accommodated to our level of thinking. And God just blows all those things away. And and so for me, as I'm, you know, look, I'm I'm studying this stuff, writing about this stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. But I'm also someone who, who, when I do ministry, I'm also doing academics, et cetera. The the thing that keeps me alive in faith is when I return to that child, like say, like. Mm -hmm. Maybe folks listening have had bad relationships with their parents, but uh, just think of someone who you can run into their arms and you think, like, that's where I feel safe. Yeah. That's where I feel embraced. It's almost like everything around you just disappears and you feel that sense mm. of, like, now I know what it means to be truly human and it's something that even I can't, can't put my finger on it, but it's something beautiful. It's something that has to be eternal. And um, When I feel that, that I'm running into God's arms – and that uh, I'm embraced by God the Father. I, uh, all hmm. my, I mean, man, I'll just end with this. Um, academia is such a weird, funky place because you get this like, I'm doing this, you know, it's so prestigious. It's very prestigious. And, <laughs> you know, you start to feel like, oh, I've published this, I've done that. It's like, big deal. Hmm. Shut yeah. up, I want to say to most academics. You know, like, go stand in the middle of a big academic library and I was doing this a couple of weeks ago and look around and realize how small and irrelevant you are from a human perspective. I don't care if you're yeah. NT right. You take up a fraction of the things that people have said about yeah. a God who can never be contained in the, all the libraries of the world and all the libraries mm -hmm. of the galaxy. Right. And so that to me at first I felt like, oh, oh, that's so striking. But then I, it was again, as if like the chains fall off and you go, now God can be my, my father again, instead of me yeah. mastering him he, he's kind of invited me in uh, as the covenant father who I know has demonstrated his faithfulness to me. Mm. And though I can't explain it and want to explain it, I'm happy to just rest in his faithfulness. Yeah. Um, and, and I need that rest, to be honest. That's brilliant. Well, and there's almost a paradigm shift in there, which the first off, the thing I love about that is it's focused, like that whole that whole idea is focused on you just basking in the presence of God. So it's not based on your studies. It's not based on your IQ. It's something that everyone can do and experience because it's, you know, it's, again, the whole conversation comes down to it's not about us, right? If it's about him and who he is and his character, yeah. and that's, you know, the solution to this problem of doubt 
if you can even call it that, is that we can physically and, you know, experientially know in a way that's beyond intellect who God yeah. is and who his character is. And yeah, so that's, that's really the, that's really the solution then, isn't it? Just to seek, to seek the presence of God in whatever ways we find it that's most powerful for us. You know, I can think, you know, maybe it's contemplative prayer, maybe it's at church or maybe it's with like a worship service. I mean, there's, I think there's numerous yeah. ways to do it, but that seems to be, listening. that to seems vinyl. to be what keeps people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, I think that's true. Listening to vinyl, is that what yeah. you said? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it, absolutely. <laughs> that's definitely where I see God. That is most. a sacrament. And He's definitely that is not. a first order doctrine that, you know, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think <clears throat> the other thing is just with the core issues of the faith, um, to remember that you belong to a communion of the saints, not mm-hmm. a solo um, Jesus is my buddy kind of thing because when it becomes like look i'm i'm having trouble dealing with this therefore yeah. i have to like unload that on everybody else it really yeah. it, it really it, it, to me it, it it's not healthy for the person who's dealing with that doubt because then you're thinking it's just me and jesus and it's like hello he died for people not just individual persons yeah and you belong to a family and sometimes you've mm. got to look to your grandmas and grandpas and great uncles and relatives and great, 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 great grandparents like Augustine yeah. and, and uh, Athanasius and go, you know, sometimes I can trust in my, in the fathers and mothers of the church mm-hmm. and I can trust in the father of the church, God. Uh, yeah. And I don't, it's not all contingent upon me figuring it out for myself. Sometimes I can rest mm. in that unknowing and it's so comforting. And you think, well, that's weak. That's this, that's, you know. And it's like, well, if you, first of all, like, you can't do anything in life with exhaustive knowledge. If you say, before I take an airplane, no. I have to know how it works. Yeah, I well, have to do the plane inspection myself, yeah. Yeah, like, we, we do that kind of thing all the time. But with God, we have, we have to be like, unless my intellect, which most of us aren't geniuses, mm-hmm. unless my intellect is essentially equivalent with God's mind, I'm mm-hmm. not going to believe in him. <laughs> This is yeah. the most preposterous thing. And I don't mean that in like a flippant way, but like that's essentially what we're saying when we're saying, I can't believe in God uh-huh. unless I can explain him. It's like, well, well, do you want me to worship yeah. you? You know, do you want me to worship yeah, you? Yeah. <laughs> then you well, would be that's, God. That's absurd too, because I mean, I think about, I was thinking about this and this is actually something that, you know, we were talking about the emergent church earlier, something that Rob Bell posed in a talk. And it's, it's fascinating me ever since. Science currently can't even explain quantum physics. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, we have this idea, which I, I, I'm not to sound anti-science, like it's brilliant that we have science and the scientific method has gotten us so far and modern medicine is amazing. And, but you know, if we, we can't even explain quantum physics with the scientific method, you know, you get to that part, that part of physics and it's, it's almost like speculative mysticism because yeah, (laughs) like, yeah, you know, stuff phases in and out of existence and this particle's in New Jersey and that one's in California. But if you turn this one, that one turns with it. And this one moves every possible way that it could move to that location until you observe it. Then it decides on a path, you know, like all of these crazy phenomena that we're observing that are beyond you know, our intellect, we can't explain them. And some of that's probably that we just don't have the tools to observe maybe what's going on. But I think some of it's like we're bumping into something that is, you know, our finiteness. And at some level, something is bigger than us. And And if we can't explain that, then we're never going to explain God fully or the resurrection. That's a great point. And I just think just to bounce off that science, right, doesn't operate like fundamentalist Christianity. Anyway, it's like, some people act that are atheists say like really hardcore atheists. They're like, I'm a man yeah. of science rather than of faith, et cetera. Um, and you go, all right, then you're a fundamentalist because you're actually <laughs> like what they think yeah. science is, is not what science could be like. Science is facts that never change and are built up like, like an indubitable, uh, inapproachable building. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not how science works. And scientists no. know this, but the yep. popular level they'll say, well, science is a bunch of, you know, they're absolute facts. It's like science works in theories. Yes, this, and there's always a reigning theory. But yeah. when the new theory comes, it doesn't just add on to the building of the old theory. It takes components of it and fundamentally yeah. restructures them. And that's how faith works. Yeah. You know, when our faith hmm. changes, it doesn't crumble like a building if we think of it as a coherent whole. Like hmm. instead of a bit, faith as a building, we should think of it as like 
a ship afloat on the sea, it's going to get some holes in it, and you can do creative things to patch it up. Maybe the ship will look a little bit different, but it's going to keep sailing. It's still going to mm -hmm. be a ship. Um, that's how science works, and Thomas Kuhn and others have talked about, um, you know, when you went from uh, when you went from uh, Newtonian physics to Einstein, it wasn't just like, yep, yeah, top that up a little bit. Uh, it was fundamentally yeah. new ways to think about the same things. And so the theory changes, yep. and guess what? It'll change again. Uh, mm -hmm. And nobody goes, well, I've lost my faith in science because they know that <laughs> there's a tentativeness about it. There's some things you can yeah. know. There's variables that stay the same. In Christianity, those mm -hmm. things would be like the, the core doctrines of the faith. But there's other things in the way they fit together that beautifully uh, are, are always shifting around. If we hmm. think of faith as able to accommodate that that sort of a, of a coherence model, then hmm. you know we're we're, we're going to find comfort and peace. That's that's good. You know that almost reminds me of John Henry Newman. He writes on that right, like on the development of Christian doctrine. That you know it's not like the goal ought to be just, oh, just read the early church fathers and the creeds in the Bible and go back to that and don't add anything to it. But the goal is mm. actually that the more you're basking in those things, which we know are a solid bedrock, mm. and, you know, if we truly trust that the presence of God is with us, then the developments that we're, that we're coming to, the theologizing we're doing, even, even though it's all rooted in our current historical moment, right? Like if you read Aquinas, there's a historical component to the things he's arguing and saying that you know, he might not have argued if he lived in 2019, sure. but yeah. building off of all of those, we're, we're coming to greater understandings and greater depths. And, uh, I think in Newman's writing, he actually compares it to like, you know, instead of drinking from this small stream, now we have this giant full river I love that. that is the river of life. Right. Um, I didn't which, know that, but I'm going to say, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you tell me that because it's, it's, it's enriching. Yeah. Well, and, and Protestants don't like to read that because he wrote that at the end of his Anglican phase and at the beginning of his Catholic phase. So they're like, Oh, well he was Catholic at that point. So we shouldn't read that, but, That's but I think it's man, brilliant. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Um, yeah. But I think it's brilliant that, you know, oh, it is. it's kind of the same, same exact problem that we run into. Like if we're like, Oh, we just got to go back to the very first things that were said and everything else is just us trying to get back to the first things. Well, that's almost doing the same the same emphasis on our ability to understand yeah. our ability to yeah. generate faith, you know, it, it's like reverse to God leading us. Yeah. Amen. No, that's like reverse retroactive fundamentalism. It's, um, <laughs> it's retrieval fundamentalism. It's like, I mm -hmm. want to be a fundamentalist, but I want to retrieve my fundamentalism. Not, yeah. from you know, Carl Henry in the, uh, in the 20th century, but, uh, uh, I want to get it from the first century cause it's better. It's vintage. Yeah. But yeah, and yeah, Thomas Oden talks about this, and the Paleo Orthodox movement talks about this, and Saint Vincent Lorenz talks about this, which Pope Francis has recently quoted, and, and others mm -hmm. to say like doing theology in, in in a way that converses with the Church through the ages doesn't mean you're you're just mechanically retrieving theology and putting it in a slot, and then it can never be touched. Mm -hmm. It means that you're actually working with the tradition as it develops through the ages. And again, mm -hmm. some of those variables stay the same, but like we don't think of the atonement the same way the early church often thought about it no. when it comes to ransom. We know yeah. none of us say like, uh, thank you God for paying my ransom to the devil anymore. <laughs> um, I, I think that the early church would have held more of a Christus Victor view. That's my own view on that. But um, yeah, that, that's why I named my church after it. Uh, yep. I thought like, yeah, why not? Um, Secondary issues don't matter, but let me just name my church after my favorite time. After a year. secondary issue. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Well, and so to kind of, to wrap it all up, I mean, all of that's obviously still relevant to the discussion that, you know, like we've been saying, just to put it all in one nice burrito for everyone listening, faith, <laughs> you know, the whole conversation of doubt really is just a hidden conversation about what is faith. Yeah. And if, if faith isn't the substance that we generate, but it's it's actually just kind of a direction of our of our heart towards the faithfulness of Jesus, yeah. then that's something that we can hold on to. And that's something that obviously that if we at all hold to the Bible, we know that God's faithful. And if we've had any experiences with him, we've experienced his presence, we know that to be true as well. So the bedrock of of our faith can be in his faithfulness, not in our, you know, PhD and our ability to think about things properly or word them well. And also 
not in this like weird swirling unidentifiable mystery that we're not going to name because it's cool to deconstruct things, you know, (laughs) but there's a, there's a real sense in which we can actually be rooted in the reality of God's faithfulness towards us. Would you say that's kind of like an accurate summary? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's great, man. No, that helps me understand what I'm trying to say, (laughs) but that's good. That's what, I mean, like that theological conversation and this is one of the things I lament about about the church just as we wrap up. Mm-hmm. What you just did and what I just did is to me um, more enriching than most of the times I spend in church receiving mm-hmm. a monologue or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I wonder just down the line, I've been pursuing this for a long time and that's what my church plant was about. How can, how can that ethos become part of the, the, the normal life? And usually it's in small groups mm-hmm. you get that. Yeah, yeah, small groups. But I, I, I really benefit from from you. Um, hopefully, if you're benefiting from me too, and oh, yeah. I, I think that's that encourages me that y- we're mm-hmm. having a conversation just as followers of Jesus, uh, and uh, we we get somewhere new from that. So that's really encouraging. Yeah, yeah. Well, any um, just as we close out here, we've kind of I think we've covered everything pretty proficiently, but just at the end of that conversation, and you know, this is you and I both tend to be this way a little more on the philosophical lines. Do you have any practical advice? You know, if there's anyone listening and they're like, okay, well, you know, that's great. I kind of understand that doubt is really more about what faith is. And I understand that I shouldn't maybe, you know, deny it, but I also shouldn't just swim in it like it's holy water. Well, if, you know, on a really on a very real practical level, if we're struggling with that, do you have any advice, any, you know, practices or ideas mm. of what we can do to, to help ourselves rest in God's faithfulness in the yeah. meantime? Um, by no means have I figured it all out, but I can tell you what's, what's worked mm-hmm. for me. Um, yeah. The last thing that I want to do when I'm in a season of a dark night of the soul is to be around people. The last thing that I want to do is to communicate with God um, mm-hmm. because I already feel dry. And so I don't want to feel like, more depressed. Um, yeah. Yet, it is our continued obedience, long obedience in the same direction. Our continued, mm-hmm. like we fight for things in life. You know, if you have a yeah. business, you say, I'm going to fight for this business over my dead bodies. And sometimes it goes under for a season, but new things happen. Mm-hmm. But we don't fight for our faith a lot of times. We just mm-hmm. kind of are happy to throw in the towel. But but I would say a way to fight yeah. for your faith is practice the spiritual disciplines. It's not works righteousness. Mm-hmm. Sit with, I, for me, it's the Book of Common Prayer. And sometimes yeah. I'll just read through the gospel slowly. This is an Ignatian mm-hmm. way of praying. And then I'll read through it again. And I'll just allow myself to sit there and picture Jesus. You know, he's on the boat calming the storm or whatever. And experience Jesus. So seek him out. The other thing is, and, and you know, let it come alive in your heart and sit with it. Uncomfortable mm-hmm. silence for a long period of time. The other thing would be to um, practice like Electio Divina. So open the Psalms, right, or any book, and like wh- the way you do this, just really briefly, is to say like, "My soul magnifies the Lord, hmm. and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior." You know, from the Magnificat, and mm-hmm. uh, for He has done great things for His lowly servant. And then you you go off that, "Thank you, Lord, for the great things you have done. Help me bring it to hmm. my mind, make me feel it, make me sense it, and just sit there and pray the Psalms and." It, it, it will it will be like water over your soul. It will just refresh you. It'll be like a sifting sanctification filter. And mm. I'm telling yeah. you, man, it, like I'm a balding dude, but it feels like the follicles on my balding head start to tingle. <laughs> um, I'm like I'm a hair That's follicle awesome. charismatic. So um, <laughs> I, I just would say oh, like man. lean into it. And then as much as you don't want to be around other people, pursue hmm. the beauty of the Imago Dei, the image of God and other people. And look for those profound moments because I, I when I sense those in conversations, when I feel the hmm. warmth of human compassion and connection, I start to go, there is something more. There is something more. Yeah. There is. Eureka. Hmm. But I forget because our minds are so seduced and distracted by this culture of, of um, busyness. Yeah. Oh, Absolutely. I'm glad you. I'm glad you kind of ended on that note because the next episode is actually about uh, technology and social media. Right um, on. Perfect. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about this. I think that I mean I know that I've found 
your perspectives on many things, but especially on this one, very valuable for my own life. And I know that that people listening will probably think the same. Uh, just as we close out here, if people have been listening to you and, and want to hear more from you or read your work, uh, where can they go to find more things that you've written, uh, talks, things like that? Yeah, yeah. So um, if you if you check on Amazon, most of the things that I'm writing um, will be there. My book from 2017, Worship in the Way of the Cross, is really a book about um, what is the church and why should we be the church and how are we transformed by the church as the church. Uh, I got a book uh, called The HTML of Cruciform Love that just came out yesterday, uh, oh, which brilliant. is a theology of the internet, and you can get that. Um, if you just oh, I need to read that. Type that in. Through. I did a demonology of the internet. Um, awesome. And uh, so that's pretty fun. And um, yeah, um, you know, if you just um, kind of check into Trinity College Queensland, uh, there's all sorts of resources there that my colleagues and I are um, on about as a community of faith and learning out here. So welcome you to check any of those things out. And thanks for Perfect. having me on, Drew. Uh, appreciate your brother. Appreciate what you're doing. Inspired by it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I definitely wouldn't be here without without your influence and in, in your teaching. So again, I'm always grateful to God for that. And uh, just thanks again for coming on. So you guys heard it from John. If you want to read some of his books, you can look up Worship in the Way of the Cross or uh, what was the title of that HTML one again? HTML of Cruciform Love. HTML of Cruciform Love, which is just such a punk rock title. Um, <laughs> so yeah, look those up. Go ahead and buy those and read them. That would be That'd be awesome. There's always good stuff, good ideas that he has, and I've benefited from them. Uh, and thanks. once again, thanks for listening to the podcast, guys. I hope that you are continuing to find value in these things that we're talking about. As always, if you have any questions uh, or any comments on you know the things we are talking about, or there's anything that you want us to cover in the future, don't hesitate. Just shoot me an email. The uh, email for this podcast is in the description, wherever you're listening to. You'll see it there. And Please, yeah, the emails I've gotten so far have really helped shape the direction of this, so keep them coming. Uh, and then last thing, guys, we are still a new podcast, so if you or someone you know is finding value or could find value in, in these types of talks, uh, we would love it if you would just leave a review on iTunes or Google Podcasts, whatever format you're listening on, and, and share it on social media if that's you know this is something you're benefiting from. It really helps get the word out so that more young Christians can benefit from these talks, uh, and that's all we have for you this time. Again, thanks, John. And uh, we'll see you all next time on The Daniel Generation. Bye.